is Stuart Cruz. I'm going to be your host today. I am the founder and CEO of Cruise Asset Management. I, I'm really excited about this guest because it all incorporates the virtual family office concept. So we work with, as I said, CPAs, but other experts. And Brian Chimney is going to be on the show. He is a uh, M&A professional. Before we get there, I'm just curious, what helped you or what inspired you to start your career in M&A? That's a great question. And, and um, it really comes down to you timing, right? I, I, I have a illustrious 34 years in the industry, as you had rattled off, and you, you, you acquire a huge taste and a body of work experience from those 34 years. And, and you get a great deal of subject matter expertise. And of course, you, you build a network, which everybody listening, and that's the holy grail, access to people's time and attention and, and alignment, if you will. Uh, about four years ago, Oppenheimer Funds, where my last stay was in corporate America, they were they merged with a firm called Invesco. And and they, uh, at the time, I said, what am I going to do? So I went in to really set up my own. I left that and set up. And prior to that, I was always raising capital, public and private, mostly public with Oppenheimer Funds, but designed some coaching material there, working with gentlemen like you and, and teams and to how to make become a better wealth advisor more holistic and address issues that back in the day when you and i started they weren't addressing you know just from the broker dealer just go after people with custodial assets and that's what you should do right so uh about eight years ago one of my friends who started the founder of vestacor approached me i have six children four of them were in college and he said hey jump come on board and help me build this out and of course, like anybody, if anybody has children and anybody has a good thing going, you don't want to just leave and jump to somebody, something else that's more of an early stage startup. So circa, you know, eight years ago, then four years ago when I did that, I said, well, he approached me again. I said, well, let me let me walk this out. Let me become a placement. I started a placement agency raising capital for entities or private funds and, and individuals and corporations via private uh, credit, private equity, private real estate, et cetera. And then, you know, COVID hit. Both of my parents uh, in the Cincinnati area had passed. And I, of my six kids, my baby was 21. And I said, well, in college. And I said, you know what? I think I can, um, I have more flexibility to do whatever I want from that perspective. So I approached Gary Rakin, the founder of, of Vestacor. We're a boutique M&A uh, advisory firm, investment bank. And he says, come in, run this and help me develop business. And the thesis was really simple. You know, M&A firms um, were all capable of doing the same thing, right? But I approached and I said, oh my gosh, I have the holy grail because I have access to wealth advisors by one or two degrees in the whole country. I have access to a plethora of, of attorneys and accountants that I've gained, uh, you know, uh, relationships with over the years, and I will be their go-to resource. So that's how I jumped in about two and a half years ago. I came on board I started refining everything that this boutique was doing, and I realized that I could provide something that in my in my doings and in my empirical data that very few, if any, M&A firms have access to. From a business perspective, is I have that one or two degree separation from every wealth advisor in the United States, right? I know what advisors do. I know what inspires and motivates them. I know how accounting firms and 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 and, and law firms work. And so I said, well, we'll build our thesis to be more advisor centric, financial professional centric, where we'll do something where most, if not all M&A firms will not do. And that is build bandwidth around talking with accountants, uh, attorneys, especially wealth advisors and their business owner relationships, their clientele, even when those people are not ready to exit. And so in the last two and a half years, I've been building out that thesis, creating formality around it, building bandwidth around it. So the unique alignment that I have with people like you, Stuart, as well as wealth advisors, uh, other wealth advisors, attorneys and accountants is, yes, I'm an M&A firm. Yes, other M&A firms are just as competent and capable of taking a business to market formally, competitively, and looking for the right solution, business partner, et cetera. But what we've done is we've built the bandwidth to become a service model, an arrow in your quiver, if you will, to, to partner up with people like you and other professionals, accountants, and, and lawyers, and giving access to advice, second opinions, 
um, just optionality of what they can do, whether they want to do it now or in the future. And that's the key, even when they're not ready to exit, right? And so everybody wants to do it. Everybody's capable of doing it that's an M&A. But who's aligning themselves with those professionals such as yourself? Who is providing resources and time and energy? And, you know, legally you would call pro bono. You and I could call it stewardship. Somebody could call it an investment of time, correct? Well, we've, we've built bandwidth around that because we know what motivates our financial professionals, you know, an end result. But we know that if we do this, our thesis is when it comes time for them to execute in some form or fashion, partially or completely, we're most likely not going to be in a bake-off because we've developed a relationship with the steward of the, the world that brought me the business owner or the accountant or the attorney. And we've worked with them pro bono, you know, air quotes, um, by being that aligned with them, even when they're not ready to exit. And so it started about two and a half years ago that pulled me, immersed me fully into the M&A space. Well, that's fantastic. That really fits within our business model. Um, you know, we're, as you were alluding to back in the day, we're just trying to manage just a particular amount of assets. and. Our business model has grown to where we want to partner with CPAs and other experts so that we are managing all cycles of our clients' journey, right? I mean, they don't they don't just want you to manage their money. They want you to help them manage their life. And they have you there to be the resource. And so as we're working with the CPA, and as you pointed out in past conversations that we've had, if and you have a business owner who's over 50, they're being approached by dozens of people to have them unwind their business. And ultimately, that's probably their plan. So we're talking with our CPA partners about working with the business owners who are gray-haired over 50 like me that are potentially going to be selling in the next three, five, 10 years. There's going to be a percent. And we want to be able to help them pre, during, post, and have the resources to be able and, this is what all of our best clients want anyway, right? They expect this out of us. And you have other financial advisors or other people, other M&A lawyers, other CPAs, other people that are just sitting back saying, that's not my job. Kind of is your job. Kind of is your job as a fiduciary to mold that experience for their life cycle, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, think of it this way. And this is where I built my thesis. Welcome to Money Talk Viewpoint. I am your host, Dennis Williams with CashMap Consulting, where we have with us Charles Dents with Excellent Profit Strategies. He is all about enabling mid-sized businesses who have moved successfully from that startup phase um, and are looking to move to the next level, but they have found that they've kind of plateaued in their revenues. Charles, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dennis. I really appreciate being on the, the show and uh, looking forward to our conversation. And just so that people know, uh, clients ask me to transform their business to increase revenue. And increasing revenue shows up in several ways, whether it's they're looking for strategic investors or they're just looking to grow their business. And the way that I do that is through increasing knowledge uh, and then one of the two things that I also include that most do not, and that's the ability to implement and then have sustainable execution. Uh, then the second thing is accelerating process, um, the strategic processes using AI tools, and as well as then establishing efficient operations, then finally scaling their companies to surpass their current growth limitations. So I kind of restate that again and maybe just like like three bullet points just so that just so we can be focused on what you're telling. Yeah. So growth happens in in really three different ways. That is acceleration acceleration of strategies implement, and implementing those strategies using AI tools. Number two would be to establish efficient operations. And number three is ultimately scaling to grow past limitations. Okay, that's great. And so each of those is a mouthful to be able to effectively achieve. Yeah. And recognizing being a small business owner, 
I'm already maxed out. So um, before I'm going to spend a lot of time, I guess my first question would be, Charles, how did you get to this and what makes you an expert? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, I started back in 2007, around 2007, 2008, and helping a couple of small startups. Welcome to Money Talk Viewpoint. I'm Sean Sal Leeson. We're a talk show for financial professionals that specialize in working with business owners, family-owned businesses, and family office. And so we, I have a myriad of guest speakers that come on and talk about different aspects of the industry. Today, I have a CPA, and it's uh, Marie Torreson. So she's going to tell us about what she does as a CPA. And let me start with, Marie, thank you for being on our show today. Thank you, Chantel. I'm excited to be here. You know, and we're glad to have you. I'd like to know a little bit about what you do, because there are different aspects of being an accountant and being a CPA. Yes. And how you got started in that industry? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, just like um, every other accountant or CPA, I, I went to college. I went to Florida Interna International University. Uh, got my bachelor's and master's in accounting, and I set for the CPA exam, which has all you know four parts. Um, but you know, it's something that most uh, people don't know, and most business biz owners don't know is that as a CPA. Um, you have different avenues, just like a doctor would eventually choose an area of expertise as a CPA, you might be focused on financial audits, uh, which is the assur assurance services, you could be in forensics, which requires a little bit more, uh, you know, specified uh, certification. There's also tax, which is most what people think is every CPA is doing taxes, which is not actually true. Um, and of course, there's also CPAs that may have transitioned from uh, public accounting to uh, private accounting, um, and they usually become controllers and CFOs of, you know, major companies. Well, let me ask you, how do you stay competitive in your industry? And what do you do that differentiates what you do from your competitors? That's a great question, Chantel. Um, so... My name is Stuart Cruz. I'll be your host today. I am the president and founder of Cruz Asset Management. We're a boutique asset management firm and virtual family office. Our guest on today, Chris Shoemate. He is a um, he is a uh, state planning attorney, and he has other state planning attorneys. He is um, trying to go down the path of providing a, a variety of additional services to his clients instead of just being one and done, right? Because you're going to tend to get better solutions when you're working together. So let me introduce my guest, Chris Shoemate. So very happy to have Chris on the show today. Um, so Chris, let me, uh, well, first of all, welcome to the show. Stuart, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. So first off, I am super curious how you went from being a prosecuting attorney to an estate planning lawyer. Like, what was that transition like? Yeah, so um, I, uh, um, kind of in a former life, um, I was uh, I was a deputy DA with Riverside County, and so um, that was uh, basically being a prosecutor, uh, put people um, in prison for a living. And so the story there is that when um, I went to law school, um, I was uh, getting a um, uh, uh, what they called a certificate, which is like a major in uh, in tax um, in law school. And um, I'd always, uh, you know, kind of been, uh, you know, um, stood in um, public speaking and um, uh, speech and debate, uh, acting, things like that. And I'd always thought about um, going and being a DA. And so when I uh, graduated from uh, law school, there was an opportunity, uh, uh, an opening for me to um, be a DA. And so um, I decided to go ahead and take that opportunity and, uh, and step into it. So backing up a little bit, my uh, my mother-in-law uh, is Kathleen Albertson, and so um, she is a uh, and was at the time an estate planning and probate attorney. And we had always talked about you know potentially going into practice together uh, to kind of have a uh, a family type office and. Um, uh, 
but when the you know opportunity came for me to become a, a, a DA, I just decided to go ahead and 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 so it was very um, uh, grateful for my time um, as being a DA. Um, I uh, prosecuted um, uh, 21 jury trials uh, through jury verdict uh, within those three years. Um, was uh, constantly uh, in uh, in trial. And uh, I worked with some of the best litigators in the state of California uh, in that office. So got really great, valuable trial experience. At the time, I had three very young kids um, and uh, my wife was uh, managing our family and I was, you know, gone most of the time. Um, and, uh, you know, being a DA does not lend itself to being a, um, you know, dad of young kids. And so I was often, you know, up, you know, all through the night preparing for trial, or I was out at some, you know, uh, homicide scene, uh, you know, overnight, um, or times where we would, you know, go out, uh, be headed up to the beach, and then I would get a phone call and have to turn the car around and go back to the office, or um, the very last trial that I was on, um, you know, my we had this trip that we were going to, and uh, I got pushed out to trial. And um, my wife had to go on the trip alone, and so uh, um, it just it, it it just didn't have a good uh, good family life. And so um, you know, people that succeed and thrive well in that office are people that you know are um, willing to you know kind of put the job first um, at all times. And so I'm grateful for my time there. Um, uh, had a lot of uh, just great colleagues uh, that I got to work with, but uh, after uh, after three years, I just kind of decided that uh, I needed to make a switch. And so then that's when I started talking with uh, Kathleen again about um, you know partnering up. What we did in 2008, and so uh, then we made our partnership official, and we uh, created uh, Albertson and Shoemate. So that's where we are today. Wonderful. So. Yeah. Um, I noticed you have the philosophy degree. My wife is also a lawyer with a philosophy degree, turned you know, lawyer, law professor. So, what is it about that philosophy degree that like lends itself to lawyers? And, and yeah, I actually, you, I actually have a, um, I have a BA in prosecuting or with your estate planning lawyer side. It's my pleasure to welcome back uh, Mr. Charles Dent from. Excellent Profit Strategies. Last time we were together, last month, we were talking about being able to move businesses that had been excellent in their startup, but as they now begin to evolve, they've plateaued. And Charles is here using three simple points that he made, and we'll let him restate those again, just for us to kind of launch the, the discussion when we move to point number two, as what those three points are that are applicable to any business of any size in which that's what he specializes in helping businesses do. Charles, welcome back. So since we 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 covered all three last week, but just for just for a real quick overview of number one, just touch on that first. And then we're going to zero in on number two as relates to Building efficient, scalable operations is where we want to spend time today. Okay. Yeah. So when it comes to implementing a, a tailored business strategy, depends on where the business is, right? So if they're struggling, if they're plateaued and they're struggling with their marketing, we tailor marketing strategies that will enable them to get in front of the right clientele, the right customer, the right client, or, or we may work with them in terms of their, their sales strategies. They, they may be limited on their ability to actually sell and marketing and sales are different. And a lot of times when companies reach a, a certain level of 25 employees or more, uh, they need to have someone who has two, wearing two different hats, someone who does marketing, someone who does sales and typically not the same person. So that, that begins to scale from that perspective. And then as you mentioned, you know, getting, getting into efficient operations, uh, that is very important to have all the, the right things in place in order to be efficient. So 
How difficult is it to make that transition to moving to scalable operations? What's the biggest barrier? It can be very difficult for a lot of business owners. And the reason is because a lot of times they enter in as an entrepreneur with a you know a great business uh, idea that they have and something that's needed in the marketplace and they're very passionate about it and they hold it very tight to the best. All of the IP that comes with it. So at some point, they need to transition from being an entrepreneur to being a leader. And what a leader does is delegate. And they have to be willing to let go of the reins of the things that they're so passionate about and then start running their company as a business. And running their company as a business means that they are delegating out the the daily activities that generate revenue for the company. What makes that difficult, Dennis, is for most business owners and entrepreneurs, they, they are so passionate about what they do. They hold on to it and they become the hub in the, in the spoke, right? The hub in the wheel. And where the spokes are not being fed as they should be, but they're the hub, everything centers around them. And ultimately what that does is it prevents growth because now that business owner, that entrepreneur, they're now a bottleneck. And they may not recognize that they're a bottleneck or accept the fact that they're a bottleneck. Well, okay, so I, I got to push back a little bit. Okay. Um, and, and perhaps there's an element here um, that they also struggle with. And myself being a former CFO, there's that issue as well of chicken or the egg, of if I'm going to be putting more money out, but yet I'm not sure what I'm going to get back because, especially if you're talking about marketing, frequently that's that's one of those things that seem really kind of soft and squishy and you're not sure what you're going to get for your investment. Do you run into that as a, one of the hurdles? Absolutely. And here. Watching Money Talk Viewpoint, and I'm Chantel Leeson. Welcome to our show today. We have some special guest for today. This is Judith uh, Pearson. Mm -hmm. I got it right. Judith and I, we've talked a little bit before the show about what you did. I want you to share with the audience. Now, you talk, we talked about your, is it trust liability? Am I right? Yeah, it's really looking at risk management and best practices for all the varying uh, wealth transfer vehicles that we see in today's world. So whether it be high net worth, ultra high net worth, transferring their assets through trusts or looking at private trust companies, setting up family offices, anything having to do with wealth transfer vehicles is what we look at. And we help families understand what the roles, responsibilities, and liabilities are of each role, how to create best practices to avoid any kind of litigation. And in case there is litigation, we put insurance policies in place. You know, Liz, I'm in I'm in family office, and a lot of people like myself who started with uh, in the investment side. Some of us went from investment institutional to retail, and then ended up in family office because we want to work more closely with our clients to give them the best possible advice and services, and not just to like jump into how much commission we're going to make. And I didn't know much about trust liability. I'm gonna, I'm going to ask you a question. Tell me about your background. I'm gonna put you on a speaker view. I just want the audience to see you. Tell me about your background and how you got started, uh, in where where you are. So obviously, with my gray hair, I've been around quite a while. I started in the in property casualty insurance industry in 1982, handling directors and officers liability insurance from both an underwriting and a brokerage perspective. And I go way back there because when I started in DNO insurance, 
we were literally teaching boards of directors what their fiduciary duties were. And it wasn't until merger mania of the 80s did you really get the construct of what we have today. And I believe trustee liability or family office liability, whatever you want to call it, is exactly where DNO was back in 1982. We're really talking to all the various people who serve in these roles. What are their roles? Who's talking to them about their roles and responsibilities? I mean, these are enormous jobs and their liabilities because they are putting their personal assets at risk. So I always start back there. I left in year 2000 and co-founded a company that provided title insurance for fine art and other important collectibles. And I got a few things out of that. One is there aren't many insurance people who have actually founded companies, raised capital, and had a liquidity event. And all the challenges in between, like we had uh, an, invest, uh, an investment manager who almost bankrupted us. We had a hedge fund whose you know, big, bad investments became our problem, even though we were a small company. And we got through all of this with no litigation. So I've actually gone through the process and understand it from the business owner's point of view. It also gave me really interesting insight into tax trust and estate issues for personal property. And that's really how I got to where I am today. We sold the company in 2010. I lived out my employment agreement and thought, you know, I don't really want to be a one product salesperson for a company I don't own anymore. And I probably have one career left in me. What am I going to do? So I went to the family offices, the trust and estate attorneys, the wealth managers, et cetera, that I've been working with. And I'm like, look, you guys know me as the art girl. I did that for 15 years. But I actually have this other big background. What's the number one issue your clients are facing today? And everybody said trustee liability. So I did a deep dive and started understanding what most of you in the family office wealth management world already know, that there's this transition from traditional trust to directed trust. There's you know a lot of private trust companies that are getting created. It's essentially the wealthy families now have a lot of different structures that you can that they can utilize to serve their purposes right so when somebody says what should i do of course i'm just an insurance person i'm not you know i don't design these vehicles but my answer is always what is the problem you're trying to solve and then once you figure that out we can talk about the risk characteristics. So that's kind of my history and how I got to where I am. And once I understood what was going on in the actual creation of these structures, I went to the insurance um, companies wondering what they're doing in this space. And essentially they all said nothing. Premiums are too small. Uh, they're thinking about bigger risks. Most insurance brokers don't really understand tax trust and estate issues. And I said, and you're not keeping up with anything. So you're not, um, you're not, your policies don't work. So let's re, excuse me, let's rewrite everything and solve the problems that our families are facing. So it's probably a little longer than you wanted, but that's kind of how I got to where I am today. No, but you, you covered a lot of material here. I want to ask you, so what do you think are the hot topics in the trust industry? And trust in, in general? Oh, gosh. Um, so hot topic number one, if we want to just say what's on everybody's radar, what should have should be on everybody's radar is the Corporate Transparency Act. That was um, voted.